Welcome everyone. I'm Tina Cassidy, Chief Marketing Officer at WGBH and coincidentally also the author of a book on suffrage called Mr. President, How Long Must We Wait? So I'm delighted to be here to talk about one of my favorite subjects today and a really inspiring documentary. Before we begin, I wanted to take a moment to introduce you to the events team who are all behind the scenes producing this afternoon's live virtual event. Abby is our Q&A manager. She'll be answering many of your questions this afternoon. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We are so happy to have you all here. I look forward to hearing from you in our Q&A. Definitely let us know where you're tuning in from. See you soon. Jamie works in our member engagement department and has a special membership offer to share with everyone later during the course of the event. Hi everybody, thanks so much for joining us today for this important conversation and I will be back later with a special offer for people that become sustaining members today. And Liz, the event producer, will be switching the camera feeds on the back end and keeping our event running on schedule. Thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Now let's begin. Welcome to our very special virtual lunchtime conversation about American Experiences, the vote that WGBH produced in partnership with the City of Boston's Mayor's Office of Women's Advancement. American Experiences, the vote tells the dramatic culmination story of the hard fought campaign waged by American women for the right to vote. The transformative culture and cultural and political movement resulted in the largest expansion of voting rights in US history. Today, we host this event to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which granted women the right to vote. We remember the unsung black and white heroines and their unwavering courage as they battled controversies surrounding the role of women and race in society. In a few minutes, we will be joined by a panel of experts who will explore the history of the suffrage movement and look at the ways the fight for the vote by women has informed the work of local community organizations, including Mass Now, Boston NAACP, and Suffrage 100 Massachusetts, and everything that they're doing leading up to the 2020 election. But before I introduce you to our impressive panel, I wanted to take a step back and orient you to the basics of a Zoom webinar. For those of you who might be new to the platform, you can see and hear us, but we cannot hear or see you. During the course of this virtual event, the way to communicate with us is by posing your questions in the Q&A tab you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Just indicate your name, the town where you're tuning in from, and pose your question, and we'll do our best to get as many questions answered as possible. Our event staff will be answering the surplus questions that we can't get to live during our conversation. If you see a question that you answered that you want answered, you can vote for it by clicking the thumbs up icon next to the screen uh, next to the next to the question on your screen and the, the questions with the most votes will rise to the top of the queue. So why don't you test the Q&A tab right now by typing in the city and state where you're from. And if you're tuning in on Facebook Live, please enter your questions into the comment sections as well and we'll do our best to get to some of those as well. Now that you have the basics, let us begin. First, we have a special mayor for Mayor Marty Walsh that we'd like to share with you. 100 years ago, our nation took a big step forward. Women's voting rights were finally recognized in the United States Constitution. This progress was hard earned. Brave, bold, and determined women led the way, including many remarkable women right here in Boston and Massachusetts. It's a proud piece of our history that we've kept alive and renewed in recent years as we've celebrated the centennial of this historic movement. As we reflect on the legacy of the 19th Amendment, it's important to acknowledge that the suffrage movement left out some women, namely women of color. Women continued to march after the 19th Amendment was ratified to ensure the voting rights for all women, not just some. As Ida B. Wells said, the way to right the wrongs is to turn the light of truth on them. In 2020, these words still ring true. As we continue our work to empower women in the workplace and in our communities, to close the gender wage gaps, to end systemic racism, and to protect and expand voting rights to all Americans, we are inspired and motivated by women who have put it all on the line to move our nation forward. You'll learn about many of these women in this excellent film, The Vote. We need to keep these stories alive. We need to continue to honor the women who are making history in our communities today in 2020. Thank you for doing your part, and thank you to WGBH 
for putting on this excellent event. I hope you enjoy the film. Thanks, Mayor Walsh. Now to set the stage for our conversation, we wanted to give you a preview of American Experiences, The Vote. Lest anyone mistake the purpose of the demonstration. So remember, men, if you come to work tomorrow and your secretary refuses to do the filing and then go home and find that your wife has refused to do the cooking, don't blame them. Remember, you gave them the vote 50 years ago. The textbooks when I went to school said women were given the vote. We weren't given anything. We took it. You had 5,000 women marching down Pennsylvania Avenue, and surrounding them were 100,000 men, many of them drunk. And they assaulted the marchers and sent 100 of them to the hospital. Alice Paul is an absolute force of nature. She's impatient and confrontational. People felt that she was going to import militant tactics. Black women have a stake in this question. They see it as part of a larger struggle for racial justice. Southerners were very frightened when the senator from Mississippi said that will be the end of white supremacy if black women get the vote. No one had ever picketed outside the White House like this before. It was a brilliant way of upping the ante. They were being arrested repetitively. The conditions that are reported seem to be wholly out of proportion to any crime. A hunger strike was taking it to the next level. The fact that a woman will put her body on the line to be a citizen is considered shocking. The right to vote has always been about power and who has it and who doesn't want to give it up. We're still fighting over who has that power. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the members of today's panel who will participate in the discussion of the film and how it relates to their work today. Sasha Goodfriend is state president of the Massachusetts chapter of the National Organization for Women, chair of the Massachusetts Commission on LGBTQ Youth, and a consultant with Boston Pride and Suffrage 100 Massachusetts. She's a social movement organizer and leader working to curate feminist and queer experiences on the personal and political levels through partnerships with statewide government and community organizations. She graduated from Boston University and received her master's in public policy from Simmons. Martha Jones is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor and Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University. Professor Jones is the author of many books, including Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on Equality for All, and Birthright Citizens, A History of Race and Rights in Antebellum America. She's also co-president of the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians and on the executive board of the Society of American Historians. Professor Jones holds a, holds a PhD in history from Columbia University and a JD from the Cooney School of Law. Tanisha Sullivan is president of NAACP Boston as, and has served in that role since 2016. She's been working very hard to bring the national NAACP conference to Boston this summer, and that will now be virtual. She's also associate general counsel with Sanofi Genzyme. She earned a bachelor of arts degree from the University of Virginia and earned both her JD and MBA from Boston College. Our moderator today is Callie Crossley. Callie's host of Basic Black on WGBH television and a weekly radio show, Under the Radar with Callie Crossley on 89.7 WGBH radio. She appears on WGBH TV's Beat the Press and she's a weekly commentator on Morning Edition. Callie's many awards as a journalist and documentarian include a National Emmy, a Gold DuPont Columbia, and an Edward R. Murrow Award. She's a graduate of Wellesley College. Please join me in welcoming our panel to the virtual stage today. Thanks, Tina. 
uh, and thank you to my panelists. Uh, Sasha, I want to start with you because um, when you watch the vote, uh, we, we women are going to say over and over again, are you kidding me? What in the world? Because it feels like it went on forever. But I want to start more simply, like who were these women? At the time of the beginning of this movement, uh, women had very limited roles. So who are the ones that decided I'm stepping away from those roles and I'm going to join this movement? And why was it important to them? Great question. First of all, I want to just say thank you again for WGBH and the city of Boston and Cali and Martha and Tanisha. I am so excited to be in conversation with all of you about the 19th Amendment and the suffrage movement because I think this is a story that we don't know enough. And that's myself as um, someone who's the president of Mass now. I only learned this history, honestly, I think mostly since working with Suffrage 100 Massachusetts. And so I know if that's the case for me, then I'm sure lots of people um, watching are probably thinking, I had no. I can't imagine what it was like to not be able to wear pants. Suffragists are responsible, for example, for wearing pants. That's a part of this suffrage movement. For speaking in public, some of these things that even come before the vote and all of the work that we are doing today um, is building off of the work that the suffragists were able to achieve since we have the vote because um, we are working for a feminist democracy as feminists today with Mass Now and Suffrage 100 Massachusetts. And um, this country was not designed to be a feminist democracy by leaving out the vote for women and Black people, um, for example. And so we, this is more important today more than ever when we're looking at um, our White House and who is in the president today. Um, and even here in Massachusetts, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and so who are these women? I think we need to think of these women as you and me. This is um, everyday people who came together first um, to realize that they weren't alone. And then once they were able to bring solidarity, both through the Seneca Falls Convention um, in New York in 1948, and um, then through their uh, women's suffrage associations, once they realized they're not alone, that's when the movement building was able to happen. Um, and that's still work that um, we are doing today at Mass Now and with Suffrage 100 in Massachusetts. Um, yeah. Well, all right. Well, thank you, Sasha. Let me move over to you, Martha, because um, for a very long time, uh, Sasha mentioned the Seneca Falls movement. At that point, uh, there was a move for in inclusivity. So all women, you know, we can think of it as a kind of a, a collaboration. But as we, as it moved forward, there was an excluding of certainly women of color and Black women specifically. Why was this happening and how did it morph into really pretty much a, a white women's uh, middle class organization? Thanks so much, Kelly. Um you know, Seneca Falls is a, a touchstone for us, certainly, um, but it's important to uh, note that African American women are not present at the Seneca Falls meeting in 1848 in upstate New York. Um, Frederick Douglass is the only Black American on record at that meeting. And despite the presence of um, Black activist women in the village of Seneca Falls, they are not a part of those proceedings. And so if we start at Seneca Falls, we have to ask the question, um, where are African American women? Because it is true um, that racism and the many manifestations of racism across the long trajectory of the women's suffrage movement will mean that Black women will also work for their political power. Um, they will also be suffragists um, in the sense that they are advocates for women's votes, but they will do that work um, in distinct, separate, and within their own movement. In, 1848, Black women are also claiming rights, uh, the right to vote, the right to hold office, the right to power, but they're doing it in Black churches. Um, they're doing it within their Methodist denominations, for example, and not 
at Seneca Falls. And as we follow the story forward, what we discover is African American women are part of this story, um, but it, they are part of a parallel movement, whether they are organizing in black women's anti-slavery societies, or they are part of the National Association of Colored Women, um, or with the NAACP, which I know we'll hear more about, African American women are not um, attracted to, are not drawn to a suffrage movement um, that trades in anti-Black racism, that is prepared to make deals, bargains um, with white supremacy in order to further the interests of women's suffrage. And so when we introduce Black women into this story, we have to go where they were and ask what they were doing. Sometimes they are intersecting with the um, suffrage associations that are at the center of this film, but most of the time they are working within their own sphere. Um, thank you, Martha. Uh, Tanisha, I'm going to quote Martha to you uh, by way of introducing uh, your question. And she says, Black women fought for voting rights, not suffrage. I think that may speak to the fact that I don't know, for a long time, I didn't really know about Black women and suffrage in this way. But of course, you and I know about Black women and their history of uh, fighting for civil rights. So talk about that tradition and where were you in understanding where some of these names that we've heard before as activists in civil rights, like the Ida B. Wellses and the Mary Church Terrells were actually also suffragists? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, there's so, so much to react to in what has already been said. Um, but where I want to begin is with this notion of power, because ultimately that's what this all comes down to, the power of the vote. And so, yes, it is true that Black women, um, since the beginning of our, our experience here in this country, have been um, seeking to uh, control um, you know, our, our freedom, our destiny, and ultimately to exercise our power. And so whether that um, has been with respect to uh, civil rights, generally speaking, or specifically as it relates to the access to the ballot box, um, we have been um, forever pressing toward um, equal access, equal opportunity, equal participation um, in this country. And um, as Martha noted, you know, we have historically um, begun our work within our own community. Um, and so when you think about women like Ida B. Wells or Mary Church Terrell or Josephine um, St. Pierre Ruffin, um, these women um, may have been hidden figures to some, but they were so very well known and well regarded within our community because they had been working for years, um, really, again, to uplift the community as a whole from within. Um, I think it, it is, as we start to talk about uh, voting, and we are reflective on what has happened in the past, I think it is important, and I know we're going to get into it, um, to, to acknowledge that though uh, Black women um, were very much so a part of the suffrage movement, very much so a part of the voting rights movement in this country um, back in the 1800s. We are still in this fight today. Um, I think it's also important to note that although Black women have historically been excluded um, from uh, really having visible leadership roles in this fight for, um, for the vote, um, that Black women have consistently, consistently over our history, um, remained very uh, vigilant in this work, recognizing that even though, whether we're talking about the 15th Amendment or the 19th Amendment, even though Black women um, were um, systematically excluded from the vote. We continue to this day um, to fight for equal access to the ballot, recognizing that when we get that right, um, that means that all people will have that right. So Sasha, uh, back to you. I think um, I probably thought always, I was mistaken, that the center of the suffragette movement was in US was on the East Coast that you know, we 
because you all the, the strong abolitionist movement and those voices that we knew here, uh, black women and white women and black men and white men here. But it really, the, the center of it was for a long time from the West coming this way. Um, talk about what the difference that makes because what, what were people doing here? Who were the local women here that we can look at? Because this, the center was not here really. Mm -hmm. Well, and the center wasn't the United States, I think, either, in a way. I think that the, so the suffragists, many suffragists were abolitionists in identity before they were suffragists. And there's a story of um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who go to the World Slavery, um, World Anti-Slavery Convention in England before the Seneca Falls Convention and they are not allowed to vote once they get there. They're sent as delegates from um, their chapters here in the States, and then once they get there, they're not allowed to vote. And the whole first day of the convention is spent um, deciding if the women are allowed to vote. They're ultimately not allowed to. They're put in a separate um, seating area, and William Lloyd Garrison acts as an ally in that sense and goes to sit with them. Um, and then they realize that they want to uh, create a convention for women's suffrage. But interestingly, in learning that many history, we also, I wasn't able to find out where Black people present at the World Anti-Slavery Convention. Um, and so I think that when we think about the origins of the suffrage movement coming <clears throat> from the abolition movement, just like the feminist movement also stem, has taken a lot of um, leadership from and organizing strategies from the civil rights movement, we also have to make sure are the people who are being most impacted, closest to the pain, as Congresswoman Presley says, in the center of our organizing. And I hope that that is the lesson we learn as a white feminist myself, um, president of Mass Now, that um, if we don't have people closest to the pain, if we're not focusing on fo people at the margins of oppression leading the movement, then our movement is not inclusive. Um, and of course, that is ringing true with the Black Lives Matter movement growing um, gladly today, also started by Black queer women. Um, so let, me, let me take it from you right now and move it over to Martha to pick up on uh, something I, I want to uh, talk about with regard to the, the, the films, the vote, which is that when we get ready for the 1913 parade, which was a, a demonstration that nobody had ever seen before of women coming together to demonstrate for their rights led by Alice Paul who as Sasha said was informed by that movement um, in England. There were rising tensions in the organization that you referenced before Martha between black women because at that point um, Alice Paul and some of the white women had decided, well, maybe we don't want those black women because it's going to sort of set us off track to our goal. Please um, explain why. She thought Thanks that. for that. Um, I just just to um, just to piggyback on Sasha's point. Um, you know, among the attendees at that 1840 World's Anti-Slavery Convention is Charles Ramond. Um, Charles Ramond is from Salem, Massachusetts, um, and he, with William Lloyd Garrison, will um, walk out of the meeting when the women are not seated. Um, this is one of our challenges in this year, isn't it? Um, to restore more fully um, the history of women's suffrage, um, how someone like Ramond can be erased um, while someone like William Lloyd Garrison is remembered. Um, but I wanna speak to Callie's point uh, because your question is an important one. Um, what is going on exactly here? Um, the example of Mary Church Terrell, um, who we've all alluded to, is um, signature in this moment. Terrell, um, in the days before the 1913 parade, is on the road lecturing. She's in New York. What is she lecturing on? Yes, women's votes, but also anti-lynching. And this is the sort of presence, this is the kind of consciousness, this is the kind of political orientation that the few dozen black women who do take part in this parade bring to this event. Um, that is not only a political agenda, it is an orientation that insists that any organization that speaks for black women must speak simultaneously to the problems of racism as well as to the problems of sexism. You know, the black women who attend this meeting will by and large um, 
Carrie Clifford is an example um, from Ohio who will um, report out um, after the meeting um, that she and the black women in attendance were um, acknowledged. Um, they were um, placed appropriately in this throng of thousands of women um, with the exception of Ida Wells, whose story we hear in the film. Um, for black women, this is a moment to stake a claim um, not only to the question of voting rights, but also to stake a claim to the public space of Washington, D.C. And while the film points to the many white middle-class women who claim Washington as their turf, if you will, claim those streets as their own, Mary Church Terrell comes home from New York on the eve of this march to make her claim on the streets of her city um, and does so on behalf of the hundreds and thousands of black women who also call Washington DC home in this moment. So Martha, there's let, 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 harmony let's, let's and there. also tension. Yes, uh, let's pause there because I want to take a, a, a look at the film uh, about that pivotal moment, which is the 1913 parade. Lest anyone mistake the purpose of the demonstration, Alice Paul had displayed it on the very first float. The so-called Great Demand. This was very bold. Women did not demand in those days. And she was putting Wilson on notice that the women wanted action. Alice also wanted it to be a beautiful parade. It was a narrative of women's progress from pioneer days all the way up to present day. The present day consisted of phalanxes of women marching by profession. You had your librarians, you had your teachers, you had your nurses. The message was this is the contribution that women make to society. For roughly four blocks, the parade unspooled along the avenue as planned. Then, rowdy onlookers began to break through the steel cables lining the route. You had 5,000 women marching down Pennsylvania Avenue. And surrounding them were 100,000 men, many of them drunk. And the men began jeering and spitting. They spilled into the path of the parade. They hurled taunts at the women. They threw lighted cigarettes at them. They plucked objects off the floats. And they assaulted the marchers and sent a hundred of them to the hospital. The police, they weren't much better. They turned their back on the parade and they're smirking like this is all some kind of big joke. So very quickly, what were marchers marching four or even eight abreast became a single file in a very, very threatening atmosphere. Only the arrival of the cavalry enabled the marchers to complete the route. One later compared the experience to being forced through the neck of a funnel. I did not know, another recalled, that men could be such fiends. Ida B. Wells took advantage of the chaos, boldly stepping in with the Illinois delegation midway through the route. Illinois is Lincoln State, she told a reporter. I don't believe Lincoln State is going to permit Alabama or Georgia or any other state to begin to dictate to it now. Given the punishing afternoon, many expected the mood at the post-procession rally to be grim. But as one marcher recalled, to our great surprise, the leaders were jubilant. If anything could prove the need of the ballot, Anna Howard Shaw proclaimed, nothing could prove it more than the treatment we receive today. Well, that's powerful information. 
I would be remiss if I did not point out that in that 1913 parade were members of the Howard University chapter of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority, of which Tanisha Sullivan and I are members. Well, right now, I want to get back to the discussion in a few minutes, but first, let's hear from my colleague, Jamie Reese. Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone at home. Thanks so much for spending your lunch hour with us and taking part in our important and timely virtual conversation around American Experience's upcoming film, The Vote. Important programs like this one are made possible by WGBH members. Viewers like you who want to keep public media alive and well and accessible to all. I wanted to take a few moments to share some details about some benefits we are so pleased to offer guests who decide to become sustaining members of WGBH today. When you support WGBH in shows like American Experience, your donation of $7 a month or more unlocks a whole new world of content. In fact, you can view more than a thousand hours of PBS and local programs with WGBH Passport through the PBS app on your TV using a digital media player like Apple TV or Roku, or you could watch PBS uh, Passport on your computer or on your smartphone, really wherever and whenever you choose. Can't wait to watch the vote when it premieres on July 6th. Well, part one is already streaming on Passport. So you can watch it today before it airs nationally. Please donate now and begin your passport experience today. All it takes is $7 a month. That's $84 a year. And while supplies last, we will also send you this WGBH duffel bag, perfect for the beach or your next outdoor excursion. All you have to do is go to wgbh.org slash support events. Please become a member. WGBH's critical backing from the community is a big part of the reason we're able to bring audiences insightful, objective, and necessary information about our past, present, and future. Thanks for your time. We hope you enjoy the, the rest of the program. And now back to Callie. Thanks, Jamie. There is a reason that the uh, second part of the series, uh, The Vote, um, is really called upping the ante because it's a big deal in the shift in how uh, some of the leaders of this suffragist movement decide to proceed. Uh, they've been polite, they've uh, tried many other things, didn't work, as you'll learn in the, uh, the first uh, two hours of the film. But one of the things that uh, stands out that I think a lot of people still don't know about uh, organizing Tanisha is that the thing that comes across so strongly is that you must be persistent and that longevity is the key, that you can't just cannot take your foot off the pedal. And as someone who leads a uh, civil rights organization, I mean, that's the whole goal, you have to keep going. So talk about that just um, keeping your foot on years and years and years, losing, 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 tiny, tiny victories and yet keep going forward. You know, we say in the NAACP Boston branch, freedom is our mission. And so that is really what our focus is on. And so for however long it takes, um, that is, we will be in, in the fight. I want to, um, to that point, I, I want to make sure that um, our participants understand that, um, that even with the passage of the 19th Amendment, um, even though Black women were very much so um, a part of um, this fight for, um, for, uh, for the right to vote for women, uh, when the 19th Amendment was passed, uh, the right to vote was passed on to white women. And the fight truly for equitable, equal access to the ballot for Black women, for Indigenous women, for Latinx women, um, for women of color, generally speaking, continued through the 1960s um, and continues today. And so I, I want to, I, I certainly acknowledge um, the moment in our history that the uh, 1913 parade marks. And as you noted, um, Callie, there was a delegation of, um, of black women 
present, um, as was noted in the film as well. I think it's important to note that um, many of those women were college age women, um, as you noted from Howard University, um, but they were even in this fight for equal rights led by women, they were relegated to the back of the parade, right? And so this act on the part of uh, Mary Church Terrell to, uh, Ida B. Wells, my apologies, to um, jump into the Illinois delegation was really an act of defiance. And I think that's important for people to know. She wasn't welcomed into that delegation. In fact, again, Black women were told, you can march with us if you must, but you've got to do it in the back. Um, and this was from our white sisters, right? And so although uh, 1913, I think, should be recognized as a bold, a moment, a bold moment in the movement um, toward, uh, so, towards women's suffrage, it cannot be considered a righteous movement. And that is because any civil rights um, movement, any human rights movement that is truly righteous is inclusive. And so I hope that today we can take from the lessons of the past and, you know, as, and I think Sasha mentioned it, we are in a moment today um, where there's still this struggle for not only voting rights, but civil rights and human rights, generally speaking. I hope that we can use 1913 as being instructive. We need all of us um, in this fight for human rights and civil rights. And it makes me wonder, Callie, what would our nation be like if in 1913, white women said, drew a line in the sand and said, we are not only going to march, but we are going to march arm in arm, hand in hand with our black sisters. What would our nation be like? Um, Sasha, one of the things that is uh, relevatory to me in the, uh, in the film are, is the power of really the corporations, how industries come together, um, the liquor industry for one and others to really put the, put the hammer down on as they see women making a little bit of inroads with not just other women, but other Americans, um, other male Americans saying, well, you know, this is not right. Uh, that hammer comes down. And I don't think we think about these movements in terms of what what economic twists and turns can happen. Uh, I wonder if you respond to that. Yeah. Also, Tanisha, I had the same question written down in my notes of what would that march and what would have looked like and how would the women's movement be different? So um, I just want to keep that in our minds. And so we are learning about organizing strategies. The suffragists um, organize using inside and outside strategies. And they kind of talk about using the different strategies in the movie to um, you know, with the differences between picketing and being jailed on purpose versus doing a more diplomatic approach by lobbying um, government officials. And I think the answer is that they needed to do both. We need to do both. We need to be in front of legislators because they are hearing from lobbyists. Um, and this is not just a democracy. This is like a capitalist democracy that we are, um, our country that we are, are living in. And, and that that messaging is still very relevant to the feminist messaging that we use today too. We know that when we pass policy like equal pay laws in order to support um, women's equal pay, that sometimes there's this uh, perception that it's going to cost us more or that it's going to be more expensive to um, pass equality legislation when actually it helps families and it helps our whole um, commonwealth and country's economy to be supporting um, more workers in the workforce, really. So I think that's a framing, a feminist framing that's really um, important to consider. And we can't, you know, we can't just not work with lobbyists because, um, because we don't see them, you know. So I think that being able to have our allies in different um, institutions who can uh, code switch, you know, speak um, informally and impublicly also. I think what this march showed is that um, 
because lobbying is often behind closed doors and the president and the government works behind closed doors as well, being making this issue front and center in the public um, is the only way in order to hold accountability to our government sometimes. Um, okay. Um, Martha Jones, at the beginning of this uh, conversation, uh, there's a note on the screen that says seven decades. I, I think we need to resonate with the fact that how long this took. And I wonder if, as we're about, we're talking about upping the ante when the, the women say, all right, we're really now going to do some stuff that nobody's seen before because you're not hearing us. Um, is there one moment in this period that you think um, had to happen to get us uh, to, the, to the end of the, the seven decades with something more than well, maybe you should vote, but you know it's not happening just yet. There's no question that, um, and viewers will see that moment when um, Alice Paul um, leads women in picketing at the White House, um, not only through um, intemperate weather, um, not only in the face of harassment, um, even in the face of um, the U.S. entry in the, for, into the First World War. Um, all of this is a, um, a direct public theatrical confrontation with the president um, that culminates in um, the jailing and, in essence, the transformation of suffragists into uh, political prisoners. Um, and this, I think, is a turning point. It brings the Wilson administration modestly, but importantly, to the table and to some degree to its knees in accommodating women um, and Wilson's ultimate endorsement of what we know today as the 19th Amendment. Uh, we're gonna look at that clip in just a second, but I just want you to, to highlight how shocking it was that she would take the battle to the White House. There's no question, and this has been Paul's um, tactic for quite a while by the time we get to that moment, which is to say the 1913 parade um, happens on the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration in Washington. So she is already um, oriented to this sort of um, very public confrontation with Wilson in particular. Um, I'll say that it also generates among American women, including among black women, um, debates about how far um, they can and they should go in the struggle for the vote. Um, African American women in the National Association of Colored Women will split on um, the degree to which they should join Alice Paul um, on the streets and in these confrontations. Uh, Margaret Murray Washington in Tuskegee, Alabama, um, will caution Black women about their particular vulnerabilities um, when it comes to street-level confrontations. Um, and she will, um, if you will, cross swords with Mary Church Terrell over this tactical question. Um, but there's no doubt that everybody understands that this is a contest that is going to finally be resolved in Congress and in Washington. Um, and in order to get it on the table in a serious way, um, Alice Paul um, definitely turns up the flame. Um, I'll note that uh, through this lens, it may sound like a, a, a debate between respectability politics and something more of what's in the streets now, for example, uh, just to say. So let's take a look at this very important uh, uh, clip, which is a pivotal moment in this seven decades long fight uh, for the vote. Alice Paul and her staff do an incredible amount of outreach. They are reaching out to nearby states, to colleges, to small suffrage groups, anybody they can think of who would be interested in coming to demonstrate at the White House uh, for the suffrage amendment. So desperate was Paul for fresh recruits that she even issued invitations to local African-American activists setting aside her deep conviction that their presence risked turning a woman's protest into a racial one. 53-year-old Mary Church Terrell 
a charter member of the NAACP and a longtime suffragist, answered the call more than once. Though she'd long ago resigned herself to the fact that white suffragists typically found it more expedient to exclude her. If you're a black woman, white women's racism is not news. Racism is the order of the day. You know what that is. But that's not exactly a reason to stay home. African-American women understood that the right to vote was yet another tool to try to dismantle the structures that were still in place even after the end of slavery and to ensure African-American safety and perhaps prosperity. So Mary Church Terrell was willing to join white women's protests to the extent that she believed it would ultimately deliver the vote for black women. For every show of solidarity, however, there was a defection. Paul was bombarded with letters protesting the picket, resignations, cancellations of the suffragist, even a plea from her mother to call off what she described as the undignified annoying of the president. Instead, the vigil continued, day in and day out, usually six days a week. By way of explanation, Paul offered an analogy. If a creditor stands before a man's house all day long demanding payment of his bill, the man must either remove the creditor or pay the bill. Alice has never lost her focus on Woodrow Wilson. In all of these years, it's always been about Woodrow Wilson. And it's still about Woodrow Wilson, the man in the White House. Well, that's a powerful end to that clip. I know you're going to want to see the rest of it. I'm going to ask each of my panelists very briefly to say, what is one thing that is being done or should be happening right now to protect the vote for everybody before we move into audience questions. So we're going to take questions. For those of you who are listening, you can add more. Um, but I'll start with you, Tanisha. What's the one thing that could be happening or should be happening right now? I think it's important, uh, particularly for those of us here um, in Massachusetts and in the Northeast, um, to be mindful that the fight for, the, for accessing the ballot box continues today. It can be easy to think that um, this is, you know, the voter suppression, um, voter disenfranchisement is something that still lingers only in the South, um, but it manifests itself even here in uh, liberal Massachusetts, so to speak. Um, and so I think it's important for folks to do two things. One, um, continue to advocate for um, laws that create equal access to the ballot box, like um, whether it is same day voter registration or um, making sure that there are, um, that we have the opportunities to, in this moment, you know, have mail-in uh, ballots for our elections. The other piece and in, in, in that's important to remember is the role that the census plays in all of this. And so um, particularly in this moment, making sure that not only your household has completed the census, um, but that your neighborhood has completed the census. I'm a big proponent of you don't have to boil the ocean and do everything, but you do, you should do what you can, where you can, while you can. So your space of influence. So recognizing that the fight still continues. All right, um, uh, Sasha, one thing. Well, you should go, everyone, to MassVote's website, and they are leading a campaign to have Massachusetts um, send mail-in ballots to everyone who's registered to vote for our primary and general elections. I think, you know, point blank, we're in a pandemic. And by the way, the suffragists also organized through a pandemic 100 years ago. Um, so think about that as our one of our resilience strategies as we're continuing to persist. Okay, Martha Jones. I'm going to give the historian's answer, um, which is to say that we're in a year where we are recovering um, the extraordinary um, courage, activism, ingenuity, and more of American women in this early struggle for the vote. Those of you at home um, in quarantine, spending more time with um, elders in particular, um, it's an extraordinary moment to take out your pen and paper or your your phone and your recorder and um, let's talk about and record um, the histories of voting rights in our own families 
Um, there are still elders among us who can tell us about their first votes, particularly those who lived through the civil rights revolution. Um, so um, we are learning our history, but let's also um, make our history um, in this extraordinary moment of 2020. Thanks. All right, we've got questions. Question from Phyllis. After women got the vote, did the women's vote have demonstrable effect on any special social changes? I guess that's a historian question, uh, Martha. I, I can take a shot at it. It's important <laughs> to say that African American women are voting in important numbers even before 1920 in California, in New York, in Illinois. And the story of Ida B. Wells and the Alpha Suffrage Club with which she is closely associated in these years is a critical one because black women, unlike their white counterparts, um, do vote um, the party line. They are Republicans almost to an individual in this period. And they will be responsible by the 1920s, for example, for restoring black men to federal office. The example is Ox Oscar de Priest in 1928 in Chicago, the first African-American men to sit in Congress since Reconstruction. Black women um, and their voting power in Illinois and Chicago are responsible for that. I'd like to add to that. I think that we can see whether it is um, through the civil rights movement, the LGBTQ movement, the ongoing um, women's rights movement, um, as women have um, played a, a, an increasing role in, at the ballot box, we have historically elected more diverse candidates, right? Bringing about um, greater diversity at all levels of government. And what that has resulted in um, is, is change and how government responds to the people. And so, again, when we think about the LGBTQ movement, we see women even here in Massachusetts on the front lines of that movement. Um, when we think about, uh, again, ongoing fight for equal pay, ERA, we see women on the front lines of that movement. And so, yes, absolutely, um, the inclusion of women um, in uh, in in the suff suffrage of, of women has meant um, progress for all of us. Uh, how, uh, Michelle asks, after, no, that's what Michelle asks, how do we, Phyllis actually asks, how do we ensure that all women are aware of their right to vote and all other rights? Um, Sasha, you want to take a crack at that? Um, I mean, so we should all be registered to vote. And then I think learning the literacy of reading up and down the ballot. You know, the vote is really just the beginning. It's, um, most people vote for election day, but still not even over 50% in Massachusetts show up for election day. So, so that is the bare minimum, but then we want you to think about um, your state house. You know, we still in Massachusetts today have less than 30% um, women in our state house and only a handful of women of color. So we need to be electing people on our state level, on our community boards, um, and bringing our community to come vote with us. Uh, I, agree. I also think there's a piece of it, um, you know, another piece of it that we have to own, and that is helping to educate um, our community about why, right? The implicit, Sasha, you're absolutely right. It's easy to, you know, folks vote in a presidential election year and they think that they're done. And the reality is the, the, um, the office holders at the municipal level um, have a greater impact, some might argue, on our day-to-day -day lives than POTUS, right? Um, and so really helping um, to educate our communities about why it is important to vote, yes, but, but the impact that you can have by voting for individuals who have values that are aligned with yours. So there's, an ed there's additional education that I think that we can um, be doing as a community to help our fellow residents. Uh, Mary Allen wants to know uh, why the panel thinks there was a Massachusetts had such a powerful anti-suffrage movement. I think you mean anti-racist well, movement. Probably. I, I'm, I'm guessing, but all right. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think we had both. You know, I didn't, I, I haven't studied the anti-suffragists that much, but I know the movie talks about them and they talk about how they come from privilege already. They're able to use their race and their class privilege in order to circumvent formal structures. Um, and, I, you know, your first question in the beginning, Callie, was about 
what is this character of the Eastern American or the Eastern United States feminist? Um, and, you know, Puritan um, segregation culture in Massachusetts is still alive and well. Uh, so, so I think that we need to be challenging our comfort levels by being able to externalize racism across the country by saying it's something that happens in the South and really looking to see how it manifests in polite ways by having formal organizations that do exclude women of color. Um, okay, Sarah from uh, Bill Ricca asks, what is the difference between gender equity, gender equality, and women's empowerment? And how does this relate to what is going on with the voter suppression of people of color that is going on in our country today? Fast, you have to answer it. <laughs> um, gender equity, gender equality, and what? Oh, yeah, and women's empowerment. And how does this relate to what is going on with the voter suppression of people of color that is going on in our country today? It's all interconnected. Um, the, the point here is that we're talking about disrupting power structures, right? And so the, the more access that whether any um, marginalized community, whether we're talking about women or we're talking about people of color, we're talking about immigrants, um, any, um, any pressure on our current system to be more inclusive, um, to create greater access to historically marginalized communities is going to be met with resistance. So when we talk about um, women's e gender equity and gender equality or racial equity and racial equality, what we're really talking about is one, disrupting current power structures that are aligned with white male dominance, um, but we're also talking about um, um, creating, again, more inclusive communities that disrupt the status quo. And so I love what Martha said earlier when she talked about, she didn't say the civil rights movement, she said the civil rights revolution. Um, and so really, if you think about it, this movement, this continued forward movement toward greater access is really about um, revolution and revolutionizing um, what's happening in our country today for the better. Um, Anne asks, is there any work that can be done here in Massachusetts to support voter rights in Kentucky now? I, I assume that's a Mitch McConnell thing, but I, I don't, that was not expressly said. Yeah, I mean, a lot of our, oh, go for it. <laughs> well, I, I just say briefly, you know, this is connected to our subject because um, we are seeing once again, as we did in the early 20th century, we are seeing how uneven access to the polls is in fact, that there is not one story, there is not one criteria, there, there is not one way to have voting rights in this country. My husband happens to not be from the United States and he cannot fathom how it is that when we vote in Massachusetts, for example, we vote one way and if we vote in Kentucky, we vote another. And this is a moment I think for many of us who are um, in places where voting rights are relatively um, undisturbed in this moment um, to be vigilant and to lift up the challenges, whether it is in Georgia or Kentucky um, or elsewhere. We've watched this in the primary season. This is going to continue um, and that we all have an interest in the um, universal access to the vote and not just our local access to the polls. That's right. And there are a number of national organizations that are focused on this, um, you know, um, that are interconnected, whether we're talking about, um, I think someone, someone put in the chat mass vote, um, even though it's a local organization, it still has nat national reach here. Um, Lawyers for Civil Rights, the NAACP, um, all of these, or the ACLU, the ADL, all of these nationally recognized organizations um, have at the, at, at, the core, at the core of their being voter rights and access. And so they all have national programs and opportunities to volunteer um, so that you can, um, you know, if you want to help um, in other states uh, where you can make phone calls or you can um, provide additional support um, through poll watching. Um, so I would encourage folks to reach out to some of um, some of those national organizations or even our local mass vote um, if you're interested in helping others across the country. That being said, there's still work to be done here in Massachusetts. So <laughs> I just want to add Mass Now to the mix. We are a state chapter of the National Organization for Women. We have an active chapter in Kentucky, and we are working with our chapters across the country now since the pandemic 
more than ever. We will be specifically focusing on Maine to try and flip Maine blue. Um, so go to our website, massnow.org, and follow us on social media to find out more about those campaigns. I don't think we have time for this last question, so I'm going to pose it to the entire audience. And you can think of it as an action plan, maybe, or an action response. Linda asks, even though women have had the right to vote for decades, women are still underrepresented in positions of power. I'm going to add, what are you going to do about it? Before I turn it over to my, my colleague, Tina Cassidy. Thank you all, my wonderful panelists, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Thank you, Callie, and to the rest of our guests today. Uh, we really thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us. I want to specifically thank our distinguished panel for joining us. Thanks to Sasha Goodfriend, Martha Jones, Tanisha Sullivan, and Callie Crossley for this conversation. I also want to thank Mayor Walsh and the City of Boston for their support for this event. And a special thanks to Tanya Del Rio, Ayanna Polk, and their team at the City of Boston Mayor's Office of Women, Women's Advancement for helping to curate the panel today. Please spread the word and tune in to the two-part American Experience documentary, The Vote, which premieres next Monday, July 6th, and also Tuesday, July 7th on WGBH2 at 9 p.m. and on local PBS stations across the country. You can also stream it on pbs.org and the PBS video app. And as Jamie Reese mentioned earlier, if you're a WGBH member, you can watch the film on PBS Passport 2 or become a member today to receive this member benefit. Before you depart this afternoon, if you can complete the survey pop-up you'll see on your screen, we'd appreciate your feedback. As always, you can stay informed on all of the virtual events we have coming down the pipeline by visiting our events page, wgbh.org slash events. Please be well and bye for now. Thanks everyone.